Good evening and welcome to the 2019 Excellence in Leadership Award Dinner. It is fabulous to be here in New York in this incredibly beautiful venue with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to give a very special welcome uh, to this evening's honoree, Carter McClellan. and also to his wife, Stephanie Palmer McClellan. And I'd like to welcome their children, Carrie, who's a Stanford uh, uh, alum, and his wife, Lisa Bozeman, and Spencer McClellan, and his wife, Eliza Adele, and Carter's brother, Jim, is also here. So welcome to the McClellan family. And in a fortuitous uh, set of circumstances, we also have with us tonight Stanford's president, Mark Tessé Levine, and his wife, Mary. So welcome, Mark and Mary. <laughs> and I want to give a special thank you to all of our sponsors and to the friends and colleagues and classmates who are here to help celebrate Carter. So the formal program and the speakers will be after dinner. And for now, I just uh, welcome and enjoy your dinner. We are ready for the reason that we're here tonight, which is to celebrate Carter. And before we do that, I, I, I want to spend a few minutes just talking about um, this, uh, this dinner and this award, which we have given out for many years at the GSB and, and why we do it and how it, how it fits in. So th this award, the Excellence in Leadership Award, was established uh, in 2003, and the purpose was to highlight the achievements of a GSB, Stanford GSB alumnus or alumna, who has made significant leadership contributions to the corporate world and to society. And of course, the central mission of the Stanford Business School is to educate leaders and leaders who will be principled and purposeful, both in their professional lives and in their service to broader society. And, if, when the, and when the GSB started, the, the, in some sense, the vision for doing that was relatively narrow. The school was basically founded to educate leaders from California to stay in California, <laughs> which is kind of amazing, actually, that that was less than 100 years ago. And today, the students that we have, they come from more than 60 different countries and they learn how to think strategically and analytically and from first principles, and they develop the skills to manage teams and organizations. They develop the ability to listen, to communicate, to inspire. They often acquire a taste for entrepreneurship and the courage to actually become entrepreneurs, and hopefully they leave with a set of values that we would like to see in all of our alumni integrity and a concern for others and an open mind. And over the years, this award has honored GSB alumni who have demonstrated exactly those characteristics in different ways, some in corporate leadership, some in entrepreneurship, some in public service, some in civil society. And tonight we honor Carter. And in that spirit, I, I wanted to just say a few things about an aspect of leadership that I think Carter um, exemplifies. So when I was thinking about this the other night because I was reading a book by one of our former faculty members and a great um, public servant as well, a man named John Gardner. And some of you may know his, uh, his writing. He wrote a wonderful book a number of years ago called On Leadership. And in that book, he identified six qualities of leaders. And actually, the, the first five are not unexpected. I'm going to talk about the sixth. So the, the first five, he, he said, was one, leaders think longer term. They think beyond the immediacy of the next you know, quarter or goal. The second is great leaders get the big picture. They understand the relationship between the organization they're running and the larger world. His third characteristic is they have an influence that extends beyond what is expected in their role. His fourth is that they emphasize values and vision. And the fifth is that they have the political skill to navigate multiple constituencies. That's a good one to read about if you're a dean. And then he has a final quality, which is, the, I think, the most surprising. And, and you'll see why it's apropos, which 
he said it's the, it's the capacity for what Gardner called renewal. So renewal is the ability to adapt to changing circumstances and to keep an organization and actually oneself fresh and innovative over time. So the way Gardner put it is it's the answer to the question of why some organizations thrive for years while others fail and why some people lose steam while others remain vibrant into their 80s or 90s. And I, I, I actually always loved that final characteristic that Gardner talked about. And it's probably because I, I work at Stanford and, and we're an institution that's fundamentally about renewal. We renew every September when we bring in a completely new set of students who th thinks that the organization was founded when they arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and that it's theirs to remake. And it's sort of true, actually. So they're not wrong in thinking that. And it's the same when every junior faculty member arrives and they want their ideas to displace the receive wisdom. And in fact, our cornerstone at the GSB, which some of you will know, says exactly that. It says that we're dedicated to the things that haven't happened yet. And so I th think that's a, also a particularly apropos characteristic for tonight's dinner, because I actually don't think I know anyone within the GSB uh, community or anywhere else who embodies that idea of renewal more than uh, Carter McClellan and his wife, Stephanie. And I think you're going to hear a little more about that from, from Cheryl in a minute and from Carter himself. But you know, he is someone who's gone from being an investment banker to an entrepreneur to a supporter of Tony Award winning musicals. That's actually Stephanie, but Carter can get, give him a little credit for that too. <laughs> to social entrepreneurship, to a political junkie, for obscure congressional races, and he's done every one of those things with incredible passion and impact. And I, every time I come to New York, I just look forward to having breakfast with Carter uh, because I, I, his, he just has an infectious energy and positive spirit, and I know he's going to have found something new that is just you know, going to be all about thinking differently and making a difference. Okay, so I, I, I want to, um, and, and just before I introduce Cheryl Dorsey, I want to say one more thing about Carter, which is he's been an incredible citizen of the GSB. And I'll just mention two things that he's done that have been uh, just uh, uh, amazing. The first is, um, after he left the GSB, he, as many of you know, he was, he was hired to work at Morgan Stanley. He was hired by Buzz McCoy, who, who was a Stanford uh, alum um, and a partner. Uh, and Carter spent many years at Morgan Stanley uh, hiring our students. And, um, Actually, I know quite a number of them are here uh, tonight. So Mary Clark is here, and Dave Hodgson, Pete Cernovic, uh, Sirkovic, uh, Dave Topper, Gary Singletary, and Bob Jeffy are all, all here. And um, I think one of Carter's great contributions to the school has been to, to give a lot of other people a great start to their careers. And the second is uh, Carter is a teacher. And some of you may know this as well, but um, one of the classes that Carter took at the business school when, that helped shape his path was uh, Jack McDonald's finance 321 class, the great investments class at the GSB. And the format for that class is that uh, Jack brought guest speakers, a uh, whole sequence of guest speakers, and exposed students to all different types of investing. And Carter, for 33 years, has been the kickoff uh, speaker in that class. Um, he's, I think he may be our longest running guest lecturer at the GSB, uh, an incredible, an incredible streak. Um, so. Uh, and I think it's just one example of Carter's incredible willingness to bring others along and his generosity in, in sharing his, his wisdom. So it's, a, it's a, just a, a huge pleasure to, to, to be here tonight in his honor. Okay, now I want to introduce Cheryl Dorsey. So we're incredibly fortunate to, to, tonight to Carter um, asked Cheryl Dorsey, the president of Eckman Green, if she would introduce him. And, um, Cheryl has a, a, an amazing uh, background. She, um, well, she started off actually going to a, a, a university that, that was unfortunately not ours, but um, <laughs> is, is also well known, but that, that's okay. Uh, and she, she, she earned an undergraduate degree. She had a, a master's in public policy and a medical degree and was a physician and uh, became an Echo and Green Fellow in 1992. Um, and uh, 10 years later, she became uh, the head of the Echo and Green uh, Social Venture Fund. And um, I, she's been an amazing leader of that organization and uh, has, in fact, given, that, given Echo and Green fellowships to many of our former students. Um, and she's, uh, 
she, she's just had a, a, a tremendous career as well in, in public service. She was a White House fellow. She was special assistant to the U.S. Secretary of Labor. She was special assistant to the director of the Women's Bureau of the U.S. Labor Department. She's been vice chair of the President's Commission on White House Fellowships. Um, she's, had, uh, she's had just tremendous impact in both the, 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 the social sector and the public sector. And we couldn't be more honored to have her here tonight to introduce Carter McClellan. So Cheryl, thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, John. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Carter McClellan this evening. So this story begins about five years ago when Equine Green was set to host an event out in the Bay Area. So early the week of the event, one of our board members was in the Union Square's New York offices with one of Carter's partners, Wayne. Uh, they were discussing the event in front of Carter. He now tells us that the thought bubble atop his head went something like this. Huh, echoing green, sounds like a bunch of tree huggers, quote unquote. <laughs> so after dismissing the idea of echoing green, Carter walked back into his office only to see an email awaiting him from one of his sons, Carrie. Carrie had actually forwarded to Carter an invitation to the event with a very simple message attached. This organization is great. You should go. So that was the nod from the universe that we needed, just that little nudge. Carter decided to join us and come along with Carrie to this event. And that's when the universe went into full conspiracy mode. So when Carter walked into the room in San Francisco, he realized that he had significant connections to our network, including those with whom he had worked professionally, folks like Steve Denning and Dave Hodgson, of General Atlantic, the leaders in the firm, respectively, that founded Echoing Green in 1987. So within three months of that first meeting, Carter joined our board, the board of Echoing Green, an organization that actually lives and breathes the notion of transformational leadership. Thus, we know it when we see it. Carter sees the best in you, in all of us, and he truly rolls up his sleeves to help you achieve your greatest potential, even before you see it yourself. So let me just share a few of his aphorisms, or as we call them, Carterisms. All right, you ready? So they run from the standard to the sublime. So I won't read it's sort of the entire list, but here's one. There's almost always a path forward. Number two, proud to fly wingman with you guys. Number three, run to the roar. So perhaps our favorite Carterism, actually it's something that we're told that came from his grandfather, is as I quote, Quote, when you're out fishing for Moby Dick, take along a bottle of tartar sauce, quote unquote. <laughs> so those of us at Echoing Green who have heard this many times have come to understand that it means not just about doing big things in the world, but also how you do big things and why you do them. You bring to bear the full measure of your merit and your medal. You be excellent in that moment. So John, you mentioned a little bit about leadership. So leadership theories abound, but I've always felt Carter embodies the best of relational leadership. It's the kind of leadership that disdains the transactional and truly focuses instead on that which is purpose-driven, that which is empowering, that which is inclusive, and that which is ethical. So when Carter invests and believes in you, you're not just colleagues, you're not just business associates, you're truly family. And so now if you've ever met any of the mighty McClellans, from his phenomenal wife and dazzling Broadway producer, Stephanie, his extraordinary sons, Carrie and Spencer, their accomplished partners, Lisa and Eliza, you know that this is a high bar indeed. But their big-hearted, their ambitious, live-out-loud approach to the world, one that has wrapped its arms around not just us at Echoing Green, but also Stanford, also Union Square Advisors, like Dr. King's inescapable network of mutuality. This is really foundational for all that Carter stands for and all that he's meant to us in terms of driving not only excellence, but impact. So let me just close by sharing some words from one of Echoing Green's fellows and a Stanford JD MBA, Laura Weidman Powers. Laura is the co-founder of Code 2040, which is an incredible organization that's working to diversify the tech sector. So Laura said, and I quote, Getting connected to Carter was one of the unexpected joys of my Echoing Green experience. His warmth and genuine desire to be of service were palpable from our very first meeting. 
but his constancy and his follow through were what set him apart from other supporters. Carter was thoughtful and clear in his support and dedicated to truly understanding the racial and economic justice issues Code 2040 was tackling. But the best part of my relationship with Carter is that it has continued past my tenure as CEO. He is now a person in my life to whom I would not hesitate to go for advice and with whom I always look forward to spending time, perfectly said by Laura. So to us, that's the very definition of family. And I can't imagine better qualities in a leader, and I can't imagine a better, more worthy person to celebrate tonight with Stanford Graduate School of Business's Excellence in Leadership Award than Carter McClellan. Carter, congratulations. Well, thank you, John and Cheryl, for that introduction. And um, thank you, Mark and Mary, for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. And it's just remarkable to me, having hung out with all of you um, before dinner tonight, uh, how many colleagues, former colleagues, the whole Morgan Stanley crowd that's uh, here tonight is uh, it's really touching, uh, as well as my entire family. So thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you being here to help me um, um, accept this uh, Business School Excellence in Leadership Award. One of the first things they do when they tell you you've received this award is they send you videotapes and speeches from prior recipients. <laughs> so you have a chance to both be intimidated and also learn you know, what, they, what was on their mind when they got the award. And I would say to a man and woman, every single one of the award winners, when I read the remarks, said in the first two minutes of their speech, I was stunned that I got the award. So let me just stipulate I felt the same way. Uh, when I got John's letter, I just handed it to Stephanie and I said, are they kidding? Uh, I don't really believe this happened. The second thing I noticed uh, when I went through these videotapes and prior speeches is that they had very little in common actually in terms of what people chose to say. Um, that their view of leadership and what they wanted to talk about when they had a chance to get up here was unique to each person that had received at least the five or six that I, that I saw. Um, and so I actually found that quite liberating. I thought, okay, um, I can talk about basically whatever I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> so by way of big background, I'm a native of Southern California. I was an undergraduate at Stanford in aeronautical engineering. I graduated in 1967. Yes, I've celebrated my 50th Stanford reunion. Uh, and um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and leaving Stanford, I was hired by Stanford University to be the assistant director of their Stanford's um, uh, overseas campus in Britain. Uh, and I met this young sophomore there, Stephanie Palmer, uh, who, as of tonight, is my wife of 49 years and four days. Uh, um, subsequent to that, one year in England, we came back. Uh, I spent three years at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, designing computers for the unmanned space race, so I am, in fact, in addition to whatever else I am, a rocket scientist. Uh, and then um, I returned to Stanford in 1971 to, uh, to uh, the quest for an MBA. Stanford Business School was actually my first exposure to business. I loved everything about the place. Uh, I love the students, the faculty, uh, the exposure to various businesses and companies that came through the campus was really eye-opening and quite enlightening. Being an engineer by training, I actually spent the summer between the two years at Stanford uh, working at Hewlett Packard, thinking that's what we do when we grow up in California and have an engineering degree, um, and thought also um, that um, I would certainly work for a technology company um, when I left the business school with my MBA. Um, as John alluded to a little bit, I took two courses actually in the fall of 1972, my, being in my second year, um, Business 321 uh, Investments with Jack McDonald, and also Money and Capital Markets uh, with Jim Van Horn. Both of those um, gentlemen were quite influential as mentors in my career. And in addition, it turned out, and this is in the 70s before Wall Street really caught on in a California business school, um, anybody who came to the business school from the East Coast generally came to return to Wall Street. So it was a real eye-opener for me to be in these two classes where a lot of people uh, were really taking courses with the view to go back to Wall Street. Um, as, some, as, as John alluded to, and many of you in the room know, 
Um, I taught Business 321 with Jack for 33 consecutive years. Um, Jack was a true mentor to me. Um, as you also know, he passed, or many of you know, he passed away last year. And I think the school lost a real icon and its faculty. Um, bravely, the GSP asked all of us co-teachers to continue on for a year without Jack. Uh, but uh, they craftily uh, substituted in his wife, Melody, uh, to keep a watchful eye on all 46 of us co-teachers while we taught the course. Melody's with us here tonight. Melody, I'm so pleased uh, you can make it. So thank you. In, in any event, the, uh, the exposure to finance and the students interested me in Wall Street, uh, and I interviewed with a handful of investment banks, and ultimately, as you might have all guessed, took a job with Morgan Stanley, um, and uh, um, left the business school in 73, and for the first time in my life moved uh, Stephanie and me to New York City. Um, without boring you with my entire career, I worked at Morgan Stanley for 22 years. I worked for 12 years at a combination of Deutsche Bank followed by Bank of America, and 12 years with a firm that I co-founded with uh, Ted Smith, a fellow, fellow Morgan Stanley alum who's with us here tonight, uh, Union Square Advisors, which is a boutique focused on the uh, technology industry uh, headquartered in uh, New York and San Francisco. Um, I'll come back to this point, but I really don't think of very much of my uh, good fortune and success along the way uh, would have been possible um, had I not spent my undergraduate years and graduate years at Stanford. Not only is Stanford a great teaching institution, but the associations it has given me in the world of technology and the world of finance are, have been incalculably valuable to me. Uh, as I thought uh, about what to say tonight about this award and what about my life might be relevant to share with you, um, I searched for some kind of overarching theme that I thought might be a useful kind of uber something to say to hang uh, above the points I wanted to make. And what I finally came up with at the end of thinking about it was community building. Uh, and I look particularly in the last decade or two at where I've been spending my time, and I think that kind of captures how I think about it. So let me highlight a few of the things that I've learned along these 46 years of working on Wall Street that I think um, relate to community building um, and are important to me to this day. First, um, I've always tried to surround myself with great people and give them a lot of rope. When I joined Morgan Stanley, and my Union Square uh, uh, compatriots are so tired of my saying this, but when I joined Morgan Stanley in 1970, it was 300 people. Um, so we think of Morgan Stanley today with tens of thousands of people. Um, it was 300 when I joined. I left in 1995. 22 years later, it was 11,000 people. And if you do the math real quickly, that's a compound growth rate of about 30% a year in headcount for 22 years. So when a company grows that fast, a lot of opportunities pop up. Uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, it turns out um, I had 12 jobs in those 22 years while I was there. Every time something new came up, they'd look around and find, try and find somebody internally that could take it. And uh, often I got that nod, as did others. Um, and when I'd find those people, um, and so as I found those new jobs, I'd, I'd literally try and find the best people I could to join up in the new activity uh, and go forward, always aiming for whatever we were trying to do to be greater than the sum of the people that were involved in it. Secondly, I've always tried to provide the team or group or organization uh, with a clear vision of where we're trying to go and still a work ethic of uh, integrity that I expect from everybody that works on the team. Uh, my third watchword is um, listen to those around you and you'll learn a lot. Uh, I remember my first client meeting when I joined Morgan Stanley it was on day five on the job. Um, I was sent to a meeting with Frank Petito, who was then the CEO of the firm and another partner, uh, to discuss uh, a financing a sports arena in Toronto. Um, at one point during the meeting, Petito turned to the sports arena developer and in this incredibly intimidating, gravelly voice said, have you got the chips to play? Um, <laughs> through a haze of fear that had suffused my entire body during that meeting, <laughs> my instant reaction was, hey, you know, if I could just come up with a handful of useful sound, bits, sound bites like that, uh, this investment banking thing won't be as hard as I thought it was. Uh, seriously, though, to this day, I don't think I ever go to a meeting where I don't learn something useful, even if the meeting doesn't wind up where I'd hoped it would. Um, equally important, um, I work really hard to create an environment um, where people are free to express their thoughts, their opinions, their hopes, their fears. Um, I believe that is the best way to get the most out of, out of uh, any team I work with. Um, my next point would be uh, get a life and maintain balance. Uh, don't let your job consume you. 
Um, while I was at Morgan Stanley, Stephanie and I had actually had an understanding that she could call my secretary and put anything she wanted on my calendar and the only, the, that pertained to the kids principally. And the only rule was she couldn't take something off without consulting me. So I actually think I had a decent track record with Carrie and Spencer as they grew up and went to collegiate in Manhattan um, and making a lot of things. And I give Stephanie a lot of credit for uh, keeping me on the beam and, and uh, developing a system where I uh, helped me balance a very uh, time-consuming career with a family life. Uh, my next point would be enjoy what you're doing. If your job doesn't remain challenging, um, you'll get frustrated, bored, or both. It took me several years at Morgan Stanley to realize that I really enjoyed building businesses, and I really thrived on the ambiguity involved in trying something new. I think that's why I always leapt at the opportunity when they offered me something new to do there, and I think it's also the reason I left after 22 years when I concluded there wasn't anything there left that was really interesting, me to, uh, interesting for me to do. Even at Deutsche Bank, which had 11 clients in the United States when I joined it in 2000, 2000, I'm sorry, 1995, and the Bank of America, which I joined on October 1st of 1998, which was the legal day of the merger between the old Nations Bank and Bank of America. In each of those roles, my job was to build an investment bank inside of a big commercial bank. Um, I found this build a business inside of a big bank thing very exciting to do. Glass-Steagall was going away, and it was a chance to really help institutions figure out how to be more successful with their capital and their intellectual capital. Having said all of that, though, the purest form of, uh, of uh, business building is to start a business from scratch. Uh, and I finally got that chance when Ted Smith knocked on my door and said, we need to start our own firm, Union Square Advisors, in 2007. And 12 years into it, I'd have to say this is the best job I've ever held. The feeling of knowing that every decision you make is important and that the startup adrenaline is one of the best forms of business satisfaction uh, has been thrilling to me. I wouldn't have traded these last 12 years um, with the Union Square team for anything. I've entered what I, which I, uh, I've entered what I uh, kind of gracefully refer to as my senior part of my career. Um, uh, really trying, re really I think either consciously or subconsciously broadening my interest into some other uh, areas. First of all, watching out over my ever-expanding family has just been thrilling. So as, as John alluded to, Stephanie started her theater company in 2002. She's brought over 100 productions to Broadway and she's won 14 Tonys, so very proud of you. <laughs> As you'll all figure out, she in fact is the family rock star. Uh, Carrie and Spencer are our two sons and their careers and families. Uh, our two wonderful daughters-in-law, Lisa and Eliza, each on their own personal and professional, professional journeys. And of course, the icing on the cake are three adorable grandchildren, Sydney Wesley and Harrison, seven, three, and two, respectively. I also really enjoy mentoring at Union Square, save one who happens to be here with us tonight, Every single person in this company is at least 20 years younger than I am. Uh, and I operate by the same principle that I've always operated by. Be clear on where we're trying to go and get out of people's way and give them a lot of rope to succeed. A couple of years ago, um, I joined the board of Stanford PACS, P-A-C-S. Um, for the non-Stanford people in the room, uh, P-A-C-S, PACS stands for Philanthropy and Civil Society. And the work of Stanford PACS uh, is to develop and share knowledge to improve philanthropy, to strengthen civil society and to affect social change. This effort is groundbreaking, and I'm honored that they asked me to get involved and join their board. And as you can sense from Cheryl's comments, occupying a spot incredibly near and dear to my heart is echoing green. Um, some of this I'll be repeating what Saul Benjamin said, but it's, 30 -year, it's a 32-year-old institution, which I discovered five years ago. It was founded, as, as John and Cheryl said, by uh, General Lanik. Uh, and Dave Hodgson, um, uh, also a Stanford MBA, is the current chairman of the board with us here tonight. David, thank you for all you do for us. Um, but notwithstanding my long history with General Atlantic, and I would say just for the record, I helped take their first portfolio company public in the 80s, Marino Associates, um, while I was running Morgan Stanley's tech group. I only learned of Echoing Green, as Cheryl alluded to in 2014, when Kerry uh, and Lisa talked me into uh, going to a cocktail party for some organization that um, they correctly uh, uh, characterized. I thought it was just a bunch of tree huggers, but I thought I'd go <laughs> and actually see what they were doing. Um, I think Cheryl's captivating. I think the fellows they have selected are also captivating. Um, I think their business model, which in its simplest, simplest form, is spotting great social entrepreneurial talent, funding them and nourishing them to realize their social impact dreams is an unbelievable mission, and I'm very proud to be associated with it. 
Outside of my day job with Union Square Advisors, this is by far my largest non-family commitment. Uh, let me end, I'm almost done, let me end uh, on one of the principal reasons I'm here tonight, and that's the educational foundation and platform uh, that Stanford University has blessed me with. For those of you who attended Stanford, you get the joke. Uh, it's a great teaching institution. It has a prime location in Silicon Valley. The weather is unbeatable. Uh, it has strong scientific roots and a global presence. It is the key linchpin in an amazing economic engine called Silicon Valley. Stanford, an abundance of venture capital, uh, and a highly educated workforce have created something truly unique in the world. More broadly, technology has affected the United States and the world in many ways, good and bad. Um, we see the positive effects every day at work and at home. I would argue that our lives are much richer, both economically and culturally, than they were 20 years ago, in large part due to technology. But technology also has its dark side, um, both around invasion of privacy uh, and displacement of labor through automation. I believe Stanford is both driving positive innovation and tackling these less positive issues head on, both with the changes in its curriculum and the broader role it's playing on the world stage. Its new strategic plan announced several months ago by President Tessie Levine doubles down on Stanford's focus on these issues. For all this and all the many positive things that are going on at the university, I'm truly proud of the association. And while I thank you, Stanford, this award, I thank you even more for what you've given me and my family and I hope I can square the circle by continuing to give back something to Stanford, meaningful of my time and energy and treasure. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, congratulations once again to Carter. What a privilege it was to get to honor you tonight, and thank you for all you've done for our institution and for everyone here in this room and the broader world. So uh, thanks again to everyone for being here, and um, you know, enjoy your final glass of wine or coffee if you'd like, and uh, I'm really, really pleased that we were able to bring everyone here together in New York. So um, what a wonderful night. <clears throat> Thank you.